Which says, thank you, Anne, for that comprehensive biography. Um, you'll probably be able to place some of it more closely because on one level my talk is going to be semi-biographical as well. I'm going to go through some of the things I've been working on also over the last few decades. Um, as you can see, I'm, uh, I'm chair, or you call it chair, we call it head of sociology. I'm overjoyed to be not chair this year, I'm on a year's sabbatical, <laughs> which is why I'm, there are two reasons I'm smiling. The one is because I'm on sabbatical, and the other is because I'm loving riding a bicycle on your flat road. I've just ridden two, two miles and I didn't even feel it. Well, I haven't, I haven't cycled since 1991, I think. So it's been great uh, and, a, and a real pleasure. Um, as you can see, um, my focus, I, I see myself as a sociologist of higher education. Um, in, but uh, I'm also historically linked with labor studies, so I've been sharing that with John. And a third of my talk is going to be about my, my old labor studies, where I was, in, I think I was an engaged scholar then. I'm now, a, I'm now involved in the scholarship of engagement, and I'm glad Michigan has shown me there's a difference on their website between an engaged scholar and a scholarship, a scholar of engagement. I see myself mainly as a scholar of engagement at the moment. Um, but I will, for a third of my talk at the end, talk about some interesting issues, I think, to share with you about issues of being an engaged scholar in South Africa in a semi-civil war. Um, and I'd be interested in, in your, your discussion around that. Um, I'm, I'm here at Michigan for a week because of the concept engaged scholarship. Um, as Anne said, I've, um, I'm a new century scholar with this very flashy title, of, we're a group of 30 from all over the world, 10 Americans and, and 20 non-Americans. And the, uh, the theme since last May, we've just finished. In fact, I'm feeling quite sad. Today is my last new century day. I'm back to South Africa and, and my passport, I'm excluded from the US on the 30th, 31st of May. Uh, although I have a J2, J2 visa which can let me in as a visitor. <laughs> um, but uh, this is coming to an end. We had our meeting in Washington a week ago where we all presented some of our research. Uh, and the focus was on knowledge center and innovation driver, whatever that means. I'm going to talk around that today. I think it's quite a big topic. And I'm going to focus on, on case studies of re university research groups uh, with a South African focus. Um, I just want to, to thank people for inviting me, both the uh, Hi and Bert and all the people that, that, I, that have given me time to be, they've I've, I've done an hour of interview often with people, and also with Anne and John and the whole um, Global Studies, Chris who's taken me around, I can't mention, I don't want to waste your time because the, there are about 15 people I really need to thank. Um, but linked to that, it, it, this talk hasn't been so easy to prepare. I must say I'm quite intimidated looking at such a large group. Um, I mean, I'm intimidated because I don't, it's not simple to know how to approach the topics. And when, I, when I'm in doubt, what I always do is I, I return to where I'm at. So I'm going to talk from a South African situation. Uh, uh, some of my findings and some of my perspectives are the same as yours, some are different. So you're going to have to connect, and, and I'll probably talk for close to, I've got quite a lot to say, I realize. Um, so I'm going to talk for three quarters to an hour and then open it up to questions. And I'll be very interested in, in, in your response, particularly the last third. I've actually never presented to a South African audience or anybody, the last third, about my labor studies engagement. So I'll be very interested in the issues and how, how, you, ta how you pick up on it. So let's go. What I'm going to do is focus on three areas. Um, and spend about equal time on each. Sorry, am I in the way here? I, I'm going to look at, Anne mentioned I'm trying to finish a book. In actual fact, the publisher has made me cut it by a third. So the one, the one hassle in my sabbatical is actually reducing a 400-page book to by a third. But it'll come out eventually. I just see it as, I just do three hours a day. <laughs> it's the only way to do it. Um, but I'm going to share my ideas the, because in actually just after I met Anne, I started a study of 11 research groups in South Africa. So I'm very interested in research centers, including the structure of the National Center for University uh, Engagement. So I, I, I study centers. Uh, but it's taken a long time, partly because I was running a master's in higher education studies 
for four years, and then uh, those of you who've been a chair or head of department, it's not easy to do research. So it's taken me eight years. But what I have done is I studied the, the 11 research centers in 2000. I revisited them in 2005, and then I went back to them again in 2007. Each time I went back, I had to change my ideas completely because they weren't developing the way I expected. So I, I did what I call a historical sociology of 11 groups, and I'm going to uh, talk to you about some of that. Um, I'm then going to go on to the, my current Fulbright research. I mean, the reason why I'm here is, is just a fluke. Um, I, the Fulbright required us to spend two months in the US, and I spent seven of the eight weeks in, in uh, California, with mainly a person involved in service learning at Monterey Bay. And they, they were, we needed an invitation, and I, I, I knew he was at the University of Cape Town and invited me to be at Monterey Bay, but then I traveled. I wasn't mainly involved in uh, service learning, because I think student engagement is different to faculty engagement. Sometimes they're the same, but I think uh, I'm interested in faculty engagement, or what we call academic staff engagement. But, but so I traveled around, and I'll, and I'll tell you what I found in the months from September to November. But I returned in December, and we each, all 30 of us had to write a midterm report. And this Russian woman on our group sent me, sent us all, we all sent each other the midterm report, and she said she'd visited Michigan State University to look at agricultural extension because she's an agriculturalist in the middle of Siberia. So I thought, let me, the, ah, extension I know, let, let me look at what's going on with extension. So I clicked extension and I hit your center. And I thought, wow, there's a national center for the study of university engagement. So I shouted to my wife, don't bother me for two, for two days, I'm clicking. And I clicked. <laughs> I read as much as I could on your, I mean, it's very easy in Cape Town to now read. I mean, I probably know more about some of your things than you do. Uh, so that's where, that's, and then I wrote to Anne and said, look, I've got to spend a, a week after the last Washington meeting looking at your coming here. And it's been incredibly valuable interviewing people. Uh, your Journal of Outlook, uh, Higher Education Outlook and Engaged Scholarship is not available yet on the website. So I photocopied a thick, the whole of Saturday, I'm now carrying it, and uh, Bert has given me another thick lot. So I'm carrying back, uh, I'm carrying back gold, as well as talking to people. So for me, it's been incredibly valuable. My last third, I'm going to share with you the problems I had with community engagement. I mean, often one thinks the problem is the universities. Uh, uh, problems I hit were with the universities, but I also had problems with the community, whatever that means. Uh, and I want to, we, we did these worker education books. Uh, and I want to talk to you about, in fact, I've written an article which I'll give you, uh, but I don't know whether anybody's ever read it, the articles in this, this book. And I'm going to share this article with you. I've had no feedback. It, it was writing 25 years later. And I want to share some of, some of the issues of trying to do scholarly engagement in the Civil War situation. And I think, actually, one was, if one's looking at a, a crisis situation, some of the lessons which I think you need to talk about, you can see them more starkly in, in a crisis situation. So I don't think they're irrelevant to what you, you're facing. They're just, they're just sharper. Right, L let me, so what, I'll start with the theoretical perspective. I'm going to, all of these ideas are in my book, and if you want to not wait for the book, you can, I've written quite some of it up in this, and I think this slideshow will be available. You, you, the, the socio our, socio our sociology association is not so organized. The 2009 article is only just coming out. I think it's just come out this month. But uh, some of what I'm saying is there. I've also written for Campus Compact, your uni United States, Campus Compact, which is mainly student surface learning, but also faculty engagement. Uh, I've written some of it up uh, there. So I want, to, I want to throw you into these ideas. I'm sure they're going to be controversial to you, and I'm deliberately giving you controversial ideas. I think we're, in a, we, we're actually facing an academic revolution since the 1970s. Something really big is changing. So I go with Henry Itzkovitz. I even think I take it even more seriously. He, he says, uh, we had a first academic revolution which began with German professors in the, 19, in the 1800s. It then spread to America, particularly in the 1880s, with the rise of your research universities. I think before that you were university colleges. I never understood why American students always say, I'm going to college. Well, they were really going to an undergraduate college. Postgraduate education is a post-1880s. 
And I think you had this first academic revolution in the 1880s. Basically, it joined the second mission of research, and I would stress their basic research, uh, research for its own sake, joined to teaching. Before that, universities were mainly teaching institutions. So I think we really had a revolution. And um, I, th I think that the, the, if I look at Michigan State University, I think it's still steeped in the first academic revolution. Departments, academics, publications, national associations, journals. My university is even more steeped in that. I think you're trying to move out of it. But um, many of the problems I found in the research groups I was studying, I think, are problems due to them trying to move into a second academic revolution. I think we're seeing a second academic revolution, not just in the US, but I think it's globally. It's starting to hit my university, where I think we, we're adding a th what Eskimitz calls a third mission. I think we're adding, he says we're adding economic development as a third mission. I would add socio-economic, and especially after speaking to other David Cooper, I'd say socio-economic cultural development. I think universities are involved in socio-economic and cultural development, and they, they, that's really what engaged scholarship is about. So I think we need to understand engaged scholarship as part, not the whole part, but part of the second academic revolution. And I have no doubt this revolution is going to take over. Um, I'm fairly determinist. One of the reasons I think it's going to take over is because industry is driving it. Um, and, I, and I think industry's force is unstoppable, actually, at the moment. Uh, and those academics who want to remain in the first academic revolution are going to have to step aside, I think. So I have quite an economic determinist position on this. What, what, when I looked at my 11 research groups, I was... I, I knew about Eskovitz's idea of a triple helix, but this was absolutely dominant in nine of my 11 groups. All of them were university groups linking to industry with government playing some sort of role. The triple helix in my research book and those groups is alive and, and, and well. What I didn't find, I only found amongst one and maybe a one and a half group, a, an engagement with what I call civil society. So I call this the orphan. And I'm interested in Michigan, you, 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 you are pushing hard on the university engagement with what you call community. Well, what's interesting is you don't talk much about, our, I was in an interesting interview yesterday, and I asked the lady, um, do you see industry as part of community? And we had an interesting theoretical discussion. Um, I think it's, so, I, I, I think one, I, I, I'm increasingly thinking we need to think about a, all four working together in, in tandem rather than just what I call the fourth helix, which is what I'm studying now. My focus of study is, is on university, what I call civil society link. But I, I increasingly, I think we need to see it as, as four groups working together. Right, so that, that was the first idea that I think, and that's part, I think, of the second academic revolution. It's got a number of components. The first component is, I think, it's being carried forward by the triple helix. The second, I think, in, I, I found interviewing my groups, when I began my research, I had a concept of pure research. I had a concept of research and of pure or basic research and applied research. But I found that a lot of my groups were doing basic and applied. And I began to say they, they I, I called them fundamental applied, because they were combining both until I came across Stokes's idea of use-inspired basic research. And I think many of us are doing what I call use-inspired basic research. Pure applied research, PAR, I would say you're dealing with a specific problem in context. You, the problem is defined. I think you, you could put my talk at the moment as use-inspired basic research. I don't know exactly how you're going to use with these ideas. I don't even know. But I know you're going to use them. Then It's not just curiosity research. So I, I think this revol second academic revolution, when often and, and people who attack it say the university is going to turn into an applied institution. Not true. What I think is moving is to become a, a use-inspired basic research institution. Um, and I would see much of your evidence-based as, as a combination of PAR and UIBR. You're probably doing both of, both of those. So both of those are what I call, when Anne gave the title of my book, use-inspired research. I see use-inspired research as a combination of UIBR, use-inspired basic research, and pure applied research. And that's what we're doing with engagement. This group is curiosity-oriented um, and oriented to publishing for their peers. But I would see engagement as this. So for me, understanding use-inspired basic research, I think that's what the second academic revolution is about. And I think industry needs use-inspired basic research. In actual fact, industry is turning to universities more for that, I think. 
uh, than that, but I'll come to that. These, the, I don't want to talk a long time because a lot of my own research in the book is about the, what I call units and centers, and I just want to throw these ideas. I'll go very quickly. I think the second academic revolution is changing the nature of organization in universities. From departments, it's not getting rid of a department, but it's adding, you can see by this, it's adding units and centers as a new structure. And I think we have to see centers it's as a theoretical uh, a structure, a new structure in the second academic revolution, which is difficult to build. I think centers, my centers rise and fall. I started with 11, 10 or eight, 8 centers, at least half of them don't exist anymore because they've been crushed by the first academic revolution. So I think we need new systems of value to nurture these. Basically, um, what I argue is that um, the first academic revolution involved a traditional small unit, you call it the principal investigator. It's a PI with a few postgraduates. Uh, they don't, the PI doesn't even call himself or herself a unit, but I think it's a virtual unit, a little, a little group. Um, I think that under the second academic revolution, particularly under use inspired basic research, but also pure applied research, we, we, I've, I've argued that at least in my data, I'm seeing three types of new structures. One is a small unit, which looks a, and I'll show, looks a lot like this. Another is what I call a network of small units. And the, other, the last one, which I think is particularly valuable, is a center, and I would argue Bert's National Center and the one that, that Center for Community and Economic Development. They are embryonic centers of the talks, the ones I'm talking about. So let's, let, let's look at this, this transformation. This transformation is fairly easy. And I think in America, it's, it's the easiest, and most people are becoming engaged scholarships using that. Basically, what you do is you simply, you, you simply stay with your old unit, which is the PI, the, what I call a researcher and a lecturer, because most of you are lecturing at the same time as researching. So you're a researcher lecturer, you have a small group of postgraduates and a few postdocs. The scientists tend to be in a lab, the social scientists say I'm in my group and you write for, peer, in, in the old first academic revolution you write for your peers. You, it's journal articles and books. If you want to do engaged research, you keep the same structure, still professor, researcher, lecturer, you keep your postgraduates post and a few postdocs, you still work in your lab and a group, but you link some of your work to industry or civil society. So you keep the same structure, but you become engaged with that structure. It's very easy, and interestingly, most, I think most American engaged scholars are using the old structure. And if you do that, it's very easy. You don't have problems. Another route I'm finding, which I didn't theorize at first, is what happens is a group of academics get together. So it's what I call a network or a cluster. So each of them is still a professor, researcher, lecturer. So you, you have three or four academics, or faculty, as you call them, and they form a network. They form a network around a research program. You might all be doing uh, engagement about, uh, about youth, problems of distressed youth. So you, you form a network, but you hold your own little group. You're still a PI of your own structure. So it's a network of PIs. Uh, and you're partly linked either to industry or civil society. So, and, and I think that's, the, the, but it's larger and it's more functional. It gets more work done. I think it's more efficient than the lone, the lone professor. But I still believe we have to form new larger centers. And I'm not going to go into reasons why we can discuss it in question. I think unless you form research centers, you're not going to get engagement work done properly. Uh, what I think a research center is, it's, it's headed by a director. So it's a much bigger and more organized structure. And under that director, what I call four, three or four PIs, senior, like I interviewed Diane Dobinek. So within the, your center, Bert is the director. And then I would argue that to be functional, you need at least four Diane Dobinek's, senior researchers, each with their own subgroups and their postgraduates and postdocs. You need a center administration structure, infrastructure of administrators and technicians, and you need a research program, and you need to link up with industry and civil society. I, I think that is an exceptionally efficient structure uh, to undertake engaged research. I think the university blocks that structure and sends you back to department and says, go back to the first academic revolution. Uh, it needs a new type of values and structures, but I think it, and it should be funded not by non-recurrent funding, it needs recurrent funding to be viable. And certainly my universities, they are collapsing. Those centers rise and fall. 
because they're not being, uh, so those are a series of issues. Just th this was a, a real live structure, uh, the Institute of Wine Biotechnology, where I got the idea of a new center. The person deliberately built a structure. He was the director. He had four seniors under him, each with their own subgroups. Um, he had postdocs, five of them, four technicians, 70. The other thing I think about a center is it should be involved in postgraduate teaching. Often not, but it should be running in, your, in my society. We only have a master's coursework uh, and thesis supervision. The center should be deeply embedded in PhD training, as he was. And he had an administrative structure and uh, assistance. He went off the year after I interviewed him to Australia, he emigrated, and his group have collapsed. They've gone back to a department because they were too worried for a whole range of reasons. So they've retreated back partly into the first academic revolution. Right, that's, that's finding three about the importance of networks and centers. Finding four is I th what I asked myself is if there's a real academic revolution, and I am a historical materialist, I don't believe that universities drive change. So I had to ask myself, well, if there's such a fundamental second academic revolution, there must be something outside that's happening that's driving this. Uh, because I don't think these things are simply a cultural revolution. And what, I, what I've argued, and I'll just do it very briefly, is, is I think we're involved in a third industrial revolution. And I'm sure you believe that in Michigan. Everybody, you, you're involved in a complete uh, industrial revolution. It's been going on since the 70s. I think the first industrial revolution, this is very schematic. The first one was for 100 years, uh, with this led by the small family firm, and you had industries like textiles, ironworking, pottery. What's important, and then later steam, what's crucial with those, that technology, I call it a technolo technological regime, universities were irrelevant. They were dr that was driven by practical men, they were men, outside mainly the university. I don't think science hardly played any role here. I think in the second industrial revolution led by Germany and then very quickly America in the 1880s and 90s, uh, I think with electricity, chemical steel, and then later automobiles, so I see automobiles in April as part of the second industrial revolution. And there's Fordism and shareholders, Ford, Chrysler, National Shareholding Corporation. Um, I think that science is becoming important but not fundamental. I think a whole lot of other things are main drivers. Um, I think in this third industrial revolution, we use the word knowledge society. Uh, and you can see this. It's, it's being driven now by tr not yet truly transnational, but large companies which are becoming significantly transnational. And if you look at this, ICT, computers, biotech, university science is absolutely fundamental. I, I haven't got my cell phone here, but I always pull it out. As an, I'm an electrical engineer. And as a physicist said to me, it was I did electric, but I didn't, that, that to understand how within a transistor, transistors are inside your cell phone, to understand how electrons move in a transistor, you need quantum physics. Without quantum physics, you can't, you, quantum physics is the basis of your cell phone. The same with, uh, I see uh, Michigan is now getting involved in biomass. Without, without genetic theory and, uh, and DNA theory, all your biomass industry, so I would argue university science and industry knows this. I think since the 1970s, they've been turning to university, not to get applied research, but to get use-inspired basic research. They want the quantum physics. They want the genetic theory. And they're actually starting to work with academics, not the pure applied people, but the, but, but the fundamental people. And for instance, Stokes has argued that in, during the Second World War, the memoirs written by the physicists about the atomic bomb they always said that was their applied work, not their real research. Their real research was quantum physics. But actually, it was a denial because their real research was fundamentally linked to the application of the atomic bomb. It was use-inspired basic research. So I think what we're seeing is a second academic transformation, which is symbiotically linked to this industrial revolution. It's joined like a, um, like a, like a cord. Uh, whereas I think the first academic revolution where research got joined to teaching there were some links, um, but not, si not significant links. So this kind of sec first academic revolution, you can see I've put it in between. It's not really part of the first and not really part of the second, because it's essential to neither. And just have, having, what struck me when I began to develop this is I actually did electrical engineering in the late 1960s. And in my class, we, div we were culturally divided between an elect A group and an elect B group. I was elect Bs. The elect A's were dealing with power supplies and motors. 
They were actually on out there. The Lekahes were part of that old industrial revolution. They were practical guys. They did some theory, but they were more pure applied research. I was part of the Select B group. We did physics for fourth year physics and mathematics. <coughs> and it was much more scientific. And I would argue we were being groomed for this new and emerging third industrial revolution. We were, we were a combination of physics and engineering and mathematics. So in my class itself, I think you could see the old second industrial revolution and the em embryos of the, f of the third. So those are various thoughts. We can come back to that. But it's arguing very seriously for a second academic revolution in which engaged scholarship is part of, linked to this new industrial revolution. Um, I just want to now talk fairly briefly uh, because my research is still being done. Uh, I, I see my moment at the moment as doing theoretical research, theories, of ideas about engaged scholarship. But I'm studying two, two research groups. Um, and I'm looking at this, going back to that university civil society. I've defined for working purposes civil society as, and this we need to discuss in, in relation to America, but we have labor and community, not only groups, but social movements what I call a social movement. So I'm interested in our university groups linked to social movement as well as social groups, labor and community. There are a whole range of other groups, women, environmental, youth, health. I, I put NGOs as also part of civil society. Uh, I'm seeing local and regional government, uh, say the, the Michigan state, I, I, would, I, I think it's easier to see it as part of civil society. But, we need to discuss that. It's a complication. But industry, I'm increasingly beginning to see as a powerful social movement. Uh, I, th I think the way to theorize industry is, is also as a social movement. Whether it's in civil society, I, I'm not sure. But, but I certainly think it's a social movement linking to universities. Um, I've mentioned how I came to, the, I stumbled on engaged scholarship in, during December. But I, I gained very valuable ideas about engaged scholarship without using that term. While I was in California, I began to see that, in some sense, engaged scholarship is being driven strongest by the health people with the idea of transnational research. I think they, they are real pioneers in how they're pushing that forward. And I was excited to find the sort of work health people and interviewed one or two. I think the urban studies people are also quite, quite far ahead in, in pushing this. The, my own discipline, sociology, uh, is, some of you might have come across the idea of public sociology. I'm, but I'm also interested in what I call organic public sociology, which I'll touch on. Because a lot of my research in my case study is looking at organic public sociology, which is an interesting concept, which I'll come to. I think the student service learning movement, I would hypothesize, is much stronger in America than your faculty engagement. In fact, you've created a real student service movement which in relation to a faculty or what we call academic staff movement of engagement is still stronger, I think, relatively. Um, I then stumbled on the, class the Carnegie classification, which for me was very valuable. But I also noticed that we could discuss that most of your leading research universities are not asking for classification. I don't see Harvard there. I don't see Princeton. I didn't even visit Stanton, uh, Stanford, although I was quite close, because I asked what, which, which faculty are linking up with the labor movement and community movements, and I couldn't get a center that was doing that strongly. Uh, industry, yes, with Silicon Valley. So, I, but then I stumbled, on, and I think it was very valuable, I don't need to talk to you, Boyer's idea, and then into the Michigan Engaged Scholarship. But why was so, it was so valuable for me to come to your concept, Engaged Scholarship, which I think is a really rich, so in my view, the, your Michigan University 1993 study and then the subsequent of a concept of engaged scholarship is a real breakthrough. I mean, I think as an outsider, I, I can stress that. You're probably too modest. I think it is a real theoretical breakthrough, uh, which you should, which, uh, as, and I think engaged scholarship is different to the scholarship of engagement, also a useful distinction. Um, why it seemed useful for me is that in South Africa uh, last year, where, as I read the documents and been involved, there's such a confusing set of terms. People talk about community engagement, community service, civic, social responsiveness, outreach. It's a whole baggage of concepts, neither, none of which really mean engaged scholarship. Um, and then you get, but politically you've got, you got what I call a fight between the community populists and the academic conservatives. And community populists are strong in South Africa. I don't know how strong they're here. Community populists are often outside the university, but interestingly some academics within universities. 
I would argue, are community populists. They argue we must be engaged, but they don't say we must be engaged with scholarship. Uh, so they, they talk about engagement, and the universities must get engaged. And I think they lose this, the, the couplet, engaged scholarship. We've got, in, at University of Cape Town, the academic conservatives are incredibly powerful, although I think industry is going to push them aside. Um, they talk about scholarship, peer review publications, and forget about engagement. And this, this group still drives uh, my university strongly. I want to just mention, you know your def definitions, I'm sure all of you know, but when I come to my work in this International Labor and Research and Information Group, uh, I, I'm going to apply your definitions because it, it, it actually helped me understand quite a lot of the issues I was being faced with. So um, I'm gonna, one, one, an important thing I think in your, uh, because I think to talk about engagement, you first need a concept of scholarship, which your 1993 uh, document stresses. Um, I, th I think it's a, the scholarship of discovery, synthesis, transmission, and application in your concept. But I think what's interesting in the concept there is it's, it's based on methods and ideas of existing disciplines, professions, interdisciplinary field. So it, it's part of the academic uh, organization of a, of a university, the centers, the units, the, the department. It has to be linked to that. Uh, I think it's often just the four aspects of Boyer, but it's also but the concept of scholarship in your definition out of your 1990 says it's based it, it's based on the ideas and methods, and I think there, those two lines are important, and I'll come back to that in terms of my labor labor group. Um, this I think is also important. Again, I'm going to come back to it, and I won't be able to flip back to this. But what qualifies a scholarship? Uh, and I've summarized, is scholarship based on accumulation of ideas and knowledge? If you're doing scholarship, it's based on a history of ideas in that area. So if I'm doing labor studies or internet, it's linked to an, a history of ideas and methods of a, a body of knowledge. Uh, important. It involves best practice work, so you must be doing cutting edge work, not sloppy work. And I'll come back to that with the group. And, uh, and, and I, I would argue it mentions I recognize it's based on ideas that are here. What I think, of, and, it, and with intelligent openness to new information, I think it involves a critical perspective. So scholarship has to be critical. You can't just accept the existing idea. So I'll come back. It's based on an accumulation of ideas, best practice, and critical perspective. Um, again, your definition I found very of outreach. This, this you all know, but I think the last line is not often stressed. But again, I'm going to stress it with my labor group. You, if you're going to do outreach or engage scholarship, it must be consistent with your university mission and unit mission. By unit, I mean your department or your center. Uh, so I think that line, again, I'll come back to. It, it must be linked to your department, your center, your, your, your academic niche, if you like. Um, I really like the idea, and we, we only have just beginning, the issue of promotion and tenure. I think you've got, again, I've come to Michigan to, to find how you're doing this. I think it's, it's really good how you're pushing that forward. Uh, I, uh, this, I think Bert was part involved. I really, and this is from Hiram's slideshow, please excuse me. I, you, I also presented this for the, uh, the Fulbright New Century. I think this is a wonderful table to show people, particularly this. My university doesn't take column three seriously. In actual fact, some schools want to remove that from promotion. I think, uh, I, I've also discussed with one, I think the idea of innovation, idea of innovation, is, uh, the theoretical concept of innovation is creating new products and processes. I, I, would, I would begin, I think that we need to think through this as innovation, new products and processes, which is different to just research, the creation of new knowledge. It's actually transforming new, uh, new knowledge into products and processes. Um, I think they're very, they're very valuable, that column. What, what I see in your documents is you don't say when a person is not doing engaged scholarship. I think we need, to, we need to say that quite clearly if we're going to win the battle. And I've got three examples, and it'll link to my, 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 my group as well. I think, and, and this is why at my university it, there's confusion over this. I think that an engaged an economics professor that's serving as treasurer of their high school is not doing, they're not doing engaged scholarship. They, they're doing what your, your documents call service. And I think you're absolutely right to say service is not always engaged scholarship. I'll go further. In my electrical engineering, I think that an electrical engineering prof who's just doing routine testing of electrical motors is not doing engaged scholarship. They're doing what I call routine testing work. 
um, and it's not classified by, by UNESCO as, as research. Um, and I think it's, so that kind of contract work where people do a whole range of contract work, which is just routine stuff, I wouldn't call it engaged scholarship. And the, the same in this, one of my research groups, uh, I, I didn't have an, uh, I'll keep it confidential, but it's linked to this example. A professor of accountancy that's actually giving courses to local government on marketing. Marketing is not, going back to this, marketing is not the accountant professor's mission. Accountancy is their mission. And they're drifting into something else for consultancy work. I don't think we should re recognize that as, we should say, look, you're doing good consultancy, but don't put that on your, uh, th that's not engaged scholarship. So I, I, I th for me, the, 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 what you're saying, what engaged scholarship is, is as important to clarify to people what it isn't. But we can discuss that. Some of you might disagree with that. Very briefly, uh, and when I go back for the rest of the year, I'm following through. I've started research in two groups. The one group is what I call what's called Val University of Technology. So I'm doing two case studies of the Val University of it's a, what we call a polytechnic or a technicon. Interesting engagement issues. Um, they're more like your community colleges or somewhere in between universities. And the other I'm looking at is what's called PLAS at the University of Western Cape, a very interesting and quite high-powered research centre. And I'm looking at how they do do work very briefly with the Val University of Technology. It's south of Johannesburg, and I think what they, this, this Val University of Technology, it's 100 miles from, from Johannesburg, th they really taking seriously the idea of regional development. And they're calling it the southern, Johannesburg and Pretoria in Gauteng. They call their, their area the southern Gauteng. So it's again linked to the idea of Michigan as a region. Um, I'm looking at one, and this is why I'm looking at an industry group and a civil society group. Uh, where I think the university needs to work on both planks. Uh, there's an engineering group really doing very interesting research on applied electronics, and I'm studying how they're doing that in terms of engaged scholarship. They've got difficulty. At least 80% of their faculty members don't have a PhD. So it raises serious issues about how do you do scholarship. But they're interesting. Another group is a nutrition group. Some of you might have heard about Sharpeville where the police opened fire in 1960 and killed about 80 people. They've just had their 40th, 50th anniversary. I was there and w one group is doing nutrition research uh, in Sharpeville. She, I asked her, how, who are you linking up with? Are you linking up with political and social movement? She's no, she's linking up with the church. The church is particularly helpful, which I found quite interesting, uh, as, an on, uh, as a group facilitating the work. So I'm looking at them. This, this university, why I've got involved is, they have a concept of new generation university. Uh, where the, they're arguing they shouldn't only create new knowledge, but they must be involved in innovation, of turning the new knowledge into products and processes. So I'm looking at how they're doing that, not just the creation of new knowledge or what they what standardly call research, but innovation, putting your research into actual practice. So that's my research that I'll be doing for the rest of the year. Just some comments on PLAS. They are what I call a real... The, 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 this is, they, they, they're an institute for poverty, land, and agrarian studies. So they work on rural areas. They're focused on rural development. Um, they're a really what I call a genuine center, but all on soft money. They, they, no, the university doesn't fund anything in terms of recurrent money, uh, but they're surviving on, for, for over 10 years. They, they're also involved in running a master's program because we don't have coursework PhDs. They do supervise theses for PhDs. So they an example, I think, of a new large center doing use-inspired basic research and pure applied. And their basic mission is a commitment to making a difference for the rural poor in South Africa. <coughs> their work is not so... It's, it's very interesting to look at how they work. They started in 1994 by working with the government. So if you think of the university, industry, government, and civil society, they moved policy research to government. They then clashed with government because the government began in 1998, 1999 to, to bolster up the traditional chiefs, to do a political deal with the chiefs, and PLAS opposed that. They then lost the support of the government. So they shifted to work with civil society organizations. They found they could work with NGOs, but they couldn't find rural farmers who really organized. So they're still looking for a rural social move. Um, so, and I'm looking at how they do, but they do work, one group are working with fisher, fisher people, another with uh, 
people living in the rural villages, very poor in the nature. So I'm looking at how they link to civil society organization. Since 2004, there's been a new Minister of Agriculture who's now more open to the idea of surplus, is going back to doing policy work for government. So I'm, inter I'm looking, I'm doing, an e I'm an anthropologist. I go to their meetings, I interview them, I hang around, and I, I'm really trying to look at how they do their work uh, in this, and they work with a critical perspective. So they, they really do, in terms of your definition of engaged scholarship, have a critical social theory. It's, it's the bedrock of their work. Just what, what's, what I've come to is to see them in terms of Barraway as the president was in 2004, president of the American Sociological Association, who introduced this idea of four types of sociology. Uh, these two are working, are really writing for other academics, professional sociology and critical sociology. This with a more self-reflective critical perspective. This is the Barraway concept. Then he argues you do policy sociology and public sociology. So he distinguishes, I find these two not so easy to distinguish at least with PLAS. So, and what I'm doing is, what I've become particularly interested, he sees public sociology as, um, he's got a concept of organic public sociology, which I'm particularly interested in studying. And, and it's in, I, I, I haven't found it a major debate here. Um, what he says is the traditional public, so, public sociology is a public dialogue, writing for the media, writing newspaper article, uh, doing policy research, engagement with your finding, policy dialogue, talking to the public, sometimes in an engaged way, but a dialogue with the public. He's got an interesting idea um, of organic public sociology where he argues that you're engaged with a social movement. So you actually, and I think what he's saying, uh, although he doesn't write in detail, is that if you're a university research group doing research, this I think you would call traditional public sociology where you get involved with a civil society group like a labor movement or a group of trade union where, where you, you dialogue with them. So it's an engagement both ways in terms of trying to shape policy and strategy. But I think this, you also, well, some groups in South Africa like class are also trying to do this. Besides shaping policy and strategy, they're trying to build up the social movement. They're trying to act in a way to enhance the social movement which is different to shaping the policy uh, and, and, and the strategy. You, you need to do different things to do that. Um, and I'm interested in how PLAS does that. It's very difficult to do that. Um, so, and I want to discuss now my last point of how, how I got involved trying to do organic public sociology with a labor group in the 1980s. Uh, so I would see that what we were trying to do was organic public sociology. Um, in the 1980s. Uh, and I'm going to share with you questions that come out of my involvement of this international labor research group. It was based in the sociology department. I actually initiated it in 1990, 1983. It was called ILRIG, the International Labor Research and Information Group. And I was a lecturer in industrial sociology. So I became the principal investigator, the PI of this group. And I, I need to just, to, to, to start a debate about the issues, I just need to give you some background. Um, I've, I've, I decided 25, that it, I actually left the group in 1989. I resigned from my own group. It's an interesting, you know, PI withdrawing. Um, and it was quite traumatic. And, and, and I haven't, but 25 years later, ILRIC still exists. And it had a 25th year anniversary in 2008, from 1983 to 2008. And I agreed to write a, a critical article. I've never had feedback, but I wrote reflections 25 years later of what I think happened. Um, so, and, and much of what I'm going to say now, you, you, I, I can send people, because you, you, I don't think this is online. Again, labor movements and s groups like this don't put their stuff online. So if you're interested in the, I can send you the article and even try and get the book scanned. There are different people writing about 25 years of Ulrich. Um, as I mentioned, I established it, so I saw, I didn't use the word engaged scholar, but I saw myself doing what, what we then called extension service. So um, as a lecturer, I was lecturing undergraduates on international labor studies. I'd done a PhD on Botswana, and I lectured on, Bots I started with Botswana trade union and Tanzanian trade union. And then I found African trade unions quite boring because they were quite co-opted, and so I turned to Latin America and started teaching Chile and Brazil and Bolivia. So I was teaching the stuff. Um, what I found, of, and what I knew from my electrical engineering department, I had a wonderful electrical engineering prof who did research on lighting. 
He, every afternoon after he lectured to us, he used to go and help firm and, and even the university on their lights. He was doing more pure applied research than use inspired by, but he was an engaged scholar. And I, he had his research group, that a traditional pr principal investigator and a few Bose graduates. So I thought in 1983, well, why don't I do this but for the labor movement? Instead of working with industry, let me do exactly the same. So I, I any, and I've just followed, uh, uh, with research grants, anybody, any tenured lecturer could start a group or a unit. Uh, so I opened up ILRIG as a research group. Um, we started doing these booklets, and uh, this is a booklet on Brazil. There's one th on Bolivia. This is Brazil. Uh, our, our men we translated all the booklets into African languages, and we did a May Day book. With the short books became much more popular on May Day than the longer book. Now I'll mention a few things. Uh, there was a history of this. There was a group in Cape Town doing what were called South African labor history books. We decided to produce our books with much more glossy pictures and, and looking nice. They, they'd done much more basic books. But they'd started the thing in, in, the early, in 1980. And a group of academics had launched the South African Labor Bulletin, which still exists. You can get it online. So there was a, I, I wasn't starting new. There was a history. Um, to ra I just want to mention a few things because, uh, because the issues come out of this. We, we got a grant from a Dutch in, uh, NGO. I didn't know at the time that they were linked to the ANC, the African National Congress. Somebody suggested to ask them for a grant, and I sent in a proposal, and I got, I got quite a bit of money to do four books. I said, good, let's go. Um, and the, the idea was to do uh, international labor, research and information, and I'll come to this. We, d we, we, we did some information, but we also had research in our title. Um, we produced, first of all, four books, and then we did an Africa series, uh, we also did information packs, a kind of education package of, on Chile, Zimbabwe, etc. Um, all, all the work, at least initially, were linked to my trade unions in the Third World Sociology Corps. So I've interviewed one person. My, my, my work was integrated between research, teaching, and engagement. It's interesting, I didn't think of it like that. And, and your center is studying the integration. But I, I knew I had to do an integration. Um, the there was a shift. We started with doing research for the booklets, but slowly education workshops, and we found people really wanted a short booklet. So there was a shift in our group from more research-based work to more education work, which I'll come back to. Then, most importantly, and I visited the Center for Community and, um, and Economic Development. You, you, uh, you've got a, a building in the middle of Lansing, uh, and good luck to you. You've survived for that. One of, one of the problems, and also strengths, of I think, Ilrig, is we, in, 1980, in 1986, a new building community house was opened up, two miles from the university. And I was overjoyed, and all of us, we, we took an office in community house. So we had a research office in the department, and, a res and, and our other office with our library in community house. Lots of issues. Before we even got into Community House, the security police bombed the foundation, they, and they placed the bomb in the wrong place. Otherwise, the building would have come down. Um, so that was the start. And, and in a sense, if you were in Community House between 86 and 89, there were meetings every day. Half the people were belonged underground to the ANC. Some were actually guerrillas. Uh, so it was that kind of atmosphere, trying to do engaged scholarship in that kind of framework. Not easy. Um, I started with two part-time researchers. By, by, by 1989, we had 10 part-time administrators. So we'd formed a center. With a, we'd actually formed a center-type structure. Uh, we drifted into that. By that time, I was, interestingly, I was doing what I call use-inspired basic research. I, I'd got involved in the study of worker council movements after the First World War, where very, most people didn't, and I didn't know about it, worker councils took over every major German city running Berlin, running Hanover, running Hamburg, and then spread across Europe. So I was interested in this worker council social movement and, and spent about three years doing research, and I'd hoped to do booklets on that, to write that up as booklets. Right, the, with that background, uh, what are the issues that I had to face? I think in Ilrig, Ilrig were now about 10 people by now, so I'm talking about 1989. We all agreed on that. We saw ourselves as helping to strengthen the emerging trade union movement, what is called the independent trade union. And I, would, I think without this new labor movement, the ANC would not have come to political power. It was one factor. 
I think uh, disinvestment, other struggles, the arms struggle as well. But I think building a labor movement was central. And we saw ourselves as linking to that. So we were engaged scholarships doing research and education to, to strengthen that movement. There, on that, there was, uh, there was no disagreement. Where, what, I, what I now, because when I wrote this article 25 years later, what I feel is there was a serious identity difference between myself and most of the rest of the group. Myself and maybe one other person. I was an academic. I was a tenured academic in the sociology department doing what I call extension work. And it's interesting, I, I looked up last, last night, we had a definition of extension work, which a group of us academics had, had, had developed. And it's very close to your uh, engaged scholarship. But none of my Ulrich group had been part of those discussions. Um, we defined extension as it's made possible by the expertise and knowledge of the academic discipline of the staff member. Very clear. So it's made possible by the expertise and knowledge of the academic discipline of the staff member who are providing such a service and is rooted in rigorous academic work of the staff member's concern. So it's based in your academic work and it must be rigorous. So interestingly, that was 1986. A group of us said, this is what we mean by extension work. Most of the people in my group, almost all, were a combination of what I call activists, education people, and research people. Most of them were quite young. They were, they were fired up by an activism, and they, saw, they had a multiple identity. They saw themselves as doing education, but their activism was as important, and their education was probably even more important work. And, and uh, some were affiliated to the ANC, some were non-ANC, but all of them were politically involved. Some with ANC and others, um, which at that time they were legal organizations. So nobody officially was part of the ANC or part of a, a, a legal organization. Uh, but they were all appointed by the sociology department. The only way I could pay them with a grant is they were sociology appointees. That was very important, although they often forgot that. They were members of the sociology department, uh, part of my research group. <laughs> right. I want to talk about um, yeah, the, the latest way is to call problems challenges. Maybe I should, I faced problems, <laughs> but let's call them challenges. What's interesting is I thought the main problem would be the security police. Not only, this is in ascending order of problem. The lowest problem was the security police, then the university, and this is my view, then the ANC and then community house. And I, expect, I would say being in community house was a major issue. Let me walk through each of those problems or challenges. We knew the security police didn't like our books. Um, but we, by 1987, we distributed 25,000 in English and uh, nearly 10,000 in, in African languages. The May Day one we produced, to our surprise, immediately we sold 10,000. Uh, and then there were resource packs. What, what if, again, reflecting 25 years later, um, and I'll talk about the, the Bolivia. We wrote a book on the 1952 National Democratic Revolution in Bolivia where effectively the ANC had a freedom charter. And in effect, I think in 1952, we felt that in Bolivia they tried to put the freedom charter into practice. They nationalized some of the mines. They gave land to the peasants. They gave education and health. And they stimulated small businesses. Very close. So we thought, let's write a book. But now, let's write a book about how the freedom charter would look if it was applied. We then showed the problems that that a country runs into trying to, and in actual fact, when I read this on the plane coming over, a lot of these problems you could read South Africa. It's very interesting. Uh, and eventually, this is 1952, eventually military rule takes over in the 1960s. So it degenerates. So we wrote this book. But I think if you had to ask, what we were trying to say is what, that we tried to let workers who read this imagine what it was like to be a worker in Bolivia. So what was it like? That, that was, I think, although we never spoke clearly. Our books, this was about what is it like to be a worker in Brazil? That was the underlying idea. And this created, we, we, we had to find a style, and we told most of the books through a story. So there, for instance, in the, the Bolivia book, we, we had a story of this woman, Domatila, who was, a, who was on the mines. So we told a lot of it through a historical narrative, semi-fiction, I would say. And there was a heavy stress on what I call the experiential voice. Through narrative, we brought in the experiential voice. And Elric was very strong on the experiential voice. I used to stress the analytical voice that built into the book should be an has to be analysis. And we all agreed on that. 
the, the, in, in the Bolivia book, it was quite easy. What we did is when we came across controversial issues, we had three workers debating things. There was an issue of whether you should be linked to a political party. The union should be linked. One worker says yes, the other says no, and other one takes a middle position. So we did debate through workers talking. So in, in the Bolivia book, it was quite easy for the analytical voice to be partly built into the workers. The first conflict we had in Ilrig was around the Tanzania book, which I wrote, because my analysis was not based on what any workers were saying in Tanzania. And I said, this has to be the Ilrig, this has to be the writer voice. When a person reads the Tanzania book, they must see that Ilrig is saying this. And we need to find a way of saying this. Some people in the group said, no, the workers in Tanzania must be, must be saying this. And, and I didn't think it was an important issue. But I think it is an important issue because there's some analytical things which workers are not saying. I think uh, scholars are saying. And I think you have to be open about what you as a scholar are saying. You can't bury it in uh, and pretend that, that the labor movement is saying this. And we, we hit problems with this. But it wasn't then a major debate. Uh, so I mentioned this, what the book was about. What I didn't expect in the Bolivia book was how long it would take and how difficult it would take. You, you can't, we, none of us spoke Spanish, so that was a major problem we had to read. It's very difficult doing a simple book. Simple books are difficult to do because you really have to be a good scholar. You don't want to write rubbish about Bolivia. And it raises that issue about cutting edge knowledge. So it took us much longer to do the research. We sent it to somebody to check. Uh, fortunately, the person who read the Brazil books was in Ilrig and could speak Portuguese. But for me, it began to be a problem. I felt we weren't often expert enough. Because you don't want to actually, I would argue, and the group felt, write nonsense for the, work, the labor movement. You want cutting edge scholarship. Uh, and so I think we hit the issue of longer and difficult became for me a major problem. And um, w w there, to just then, the, then an interesting hap thing happened. The book was banned by what's called the South African Publication Board. Some of us, particularly myself, had a position of what I call a war position. We should fight a legal struggle. But the way to build up the labor movement is to find the legal space. Uh, to, to, so we, took, we had a very good lawyer who took the book, who argued, went before the publication board. Uh, at that time, discourse theory wasn't, uh, wasn't well known. And he said to the publication board, where the, the, we had, there was a very sophisticated academic who'd read the book conservative who said, this book is revolutionary and calling for action. Uh, and our lawyer said, but where is the word revolution mentioned in the book? Uh, he took a content approach, and where is the call for action? And he won it. Uh, so we, the book was then unbanned. And after that, occasionally the police visited the, the university, but we, we were in the, we, we, I took seriously our research. We were, we were present in the university research report. And our university was quite supportive. So that comes to the university. What was interesting is our vice chancellor, new vice chancellor, gave, gave support to Ilrig. He actually, he actually instructed the administrators in the research office to lodge our unit as a unit. He, said he wanted us to change the name Ilrig, International Labor Research and Information Group. He said, the G is too much a big group. I want you to call it a project, a P. But by that time, we'd already advertised Ilrig as an Ilrig, not an Ilrup. So we ignored it, and he didn't ever call us in. My department supported it, but it, what I found most difficult is not getting support from faculty, but getting them to, to actually get involved. For instance, I asked one person to write on the Russian Revolution, another on other, on other, other changes. It was very difficult to get other faculty involved. Um, the research committee said we're not doing research. They didn't want us to fall under the research committee. Although I argued we're doing research. And what I said about Bolivia, I really think actually the research side was most difficult. So we fell under a new committee called Extension. Uh, so there was a split between the research and extension committee. I never, I used to argue with the, with the research committee and other, other scholars that writing a simple book, and I still hold this, if you're a quantum physics, try if you're a quantum physics professor, writing a simple book about what quantum physics is for K-12 K people. It's very difficult, it's more difficult than writing a journal article. So I think to be a scholar writing simple is difficult. Um, occasionally the university and my own department said, why aren't you writing more peer review publications? In retrospect, I think we should have written more. But uh, in actual fact, the, the university was not an issue. What I didn't expect is the ANC would become a problem. 
and they actually, in a sense, cut off our funding, uh, or at least groups did. Um, there are comp I still don't fully understand why it happened, but at least some of the issues was w we, we had started with working with Cape Town unions uh, as part of the Liberals in Cape Town. And those unions began to question the United Democratic Front, which was a popular front, and they actually didn't join the UDF. And that created enormous tension. And so, and we were seen as part, in fact, like I thought the unions were wrong not to join the UDF. But again, in such a charged political, whatever one said, one was seen as part of the union. So that, I think, was the first issue. I, this was my, I felt that in the, in the 19, from 1985, there was too much stress on what I call mobilization, marches, uh, even underground struggle. I think they were very important. But I, my own position, which wasn't, a, I, I, not such a public debate, but I felt organization, actually building shop steward committees, was more important than mobilization or at least more important than it was being stressed. And, and that was a tension, because our book certainly stressed organization. What did become a problem is that our books were quite, they called it classist. We, we raised issues of race and national struggle, like in Bra Brazil and Bolivia. But there was a class underlying stress. And, at, and certainly at that time, the UDF was not stressing class. Um, and, and so our books were seen as classes. But I think, if I had to guess, our biggest problem was Brazil. And again, my naivety. I knew when we chose Brazil in 1984, there, there was the issue of the Workers' Party, which, which Lula, today's president, the Workers' Party growing up as a party linked to the automobile workers, to the worker union. So there was an interesting link between the, the trade unions and the political party. But what interested me most in the Bolivia was that under military repression, you could still organize a trade union movement. Brazil is a very interesting example within military repression. I was also interested in understanding what in the literature said bureaucratic authoritarianism, which I thought South Africa was very similar to Brazil as a bureaucratic authoritarianism. So at least those two ideas of, of building movements under oppression and the, the nature of the state, I, those were the lessons for me, not the issue of the Workers' Party. But the Brazilian Workers' Party was against the Communist Party in Brazil. So this, and this book was taken as we were supporting a Workers' Party against the South African Communist Party. Uh, and some trade unions were arguing that. So we were seen as what we call the workers supporting. Uh, and no matter, that wasn't actually my position. But you enter this. Uh, as one, one of my black researchers said, don't go into this naively, wake up. Uh, you're in a political minefield. Um, there was another issue of I appointed particularly black researchers on academic grounds. I didn't ask them whether they were UDF, ANC, or, non, or anti. My prime concern was I wanted good researchers. And, and I still hold to that. But wh wh what happened is we heard that the knob of that Dutch agency was, was cutting our funds off in the next round. So, and I was fundraising in 1988, and I went to see Nogob, and they said, go and, see, uh, go and see the ANC. So I took my little son on the, ch on the, on the train, and we went to a cafe in London and, and met with young ANC people. And I argued, look, we're doing worker education, and there's debate, and we're not taking political sides. I myself, I said, as, as ANC, I, I support the ANC, although I'm not a member. Um, please support it. That they felt, that for whatever reason, they felt the thing was too political and, uh, and th they raised questions. They said to me, why have you got all these black researchers who are not, who not ANC aligned? When I said they appointed them because of academic reasons, they didn't like the idea. They said, you appoint ANC people. So, um, to just summarize, ev eventually that came to a head in 89 um, and, and I think the reasons I had to withdraw from the group was a series of reasons becoming more and more important. I, it was clear that for me, while I was involved in research on the European labor issue, the group as a whole was doing much more education workshops and library resources. So there was a tension. And actually, I, they were, my own group was saying, why are you taking so long doing the research? Uh, and my reply was, I still don't understand the European labor movement. But, so it was really an issue of use-inspired basic research. Was, versus more immediate. And I think what a debate emerged between what I call, uh, I was basically arguing for theory from, as an academic based in the university. Others in the group were saying we need to stress worker experience, activism, and struggle. And, and this became a real tension. 
And it, sometimes it even took, uh, although interestingly not amongst black researchers, but uh, some of the white research saying you're just an academic at the university. You're losing touch with experience, activism, and struggle. And in some senses that was right. And I still say it's not, it's not one's main role. I was getting certainly involved in longer term research rather than shorty, sh uh, short term issues. I was beginning to worry about the academic work that we were doing. For instance, w w some researchers brought out a pack on solidarity in Poland. I thought this was bad research. It was quick and dirty and not, not serious enough. And even some of it factually not so good. But uh, I, I raised questions and they said, well, we need to do the research quickly. Uh, it's topical and it must come out. And the same thing emerged when, when people proposed we must do a newsletter. And I think for me that links back to uh, MSU's definition of scholarship. You cannot get invade, in, involved in, as an engaged scholar unless your scholarship is good. I still hold to this. Uh, no matter how immediate the other work is needed. But this was never, um, never, never resolved. Uh, and, but what became, a, these two became a central issue. At the time, the trade unions were worried about NGOs and saying NGOs are not accountable to us. They're running our education programs, um, these service organizations, as they call, and, 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 and they need to be more accountable to the labor movement, which led to at least um, one or two Ilric people proposing we should come under the direct discipline of the trade unions. That when we run a workshop, they must decide what is done and how it is done for education workshop. For me, this is really a complication. A, a university-based research group coming under the direct discipline of, 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 but this was being directly proposed. And I had to ask myself, what about our books then? Would they be vetoed? And, and, and what is the autonomy of scholarship? Uh, which, w I mean, you, in a sense, you often, I suppose, here in Michigan, you're not faced directly with that. Being in Community House in 1989 in South Africa, this was a central issue. Um, and then, finally, the, I think the final thing that persuaded me was that I saw our group, and it links to that Michigan idea that it must be based on your niche. My, our niche, as I saw it, was ILRIG, International Labor Research and Information Group, based in the sociology department under industrial sociology. We got a request to write a, a booklet on the bus boycott in Cape Town. I said to my group that that's nothing to do with industrial sociology. It's more needed than industrial sociology, but it's not our niche. They said niche mish, it's needed. Um, uh, you know, and so they were actually asking me to move out of my, the niche. Um, and I, I, I could see this was impossible. Um, so I, so I, I moved out. What happened is, is Ilric changed, we had an interesting debate about whether the R stands for research or resource. And I think it's a, and, and they were right. They wanted to be a resource group more than a research group. And they changed the name, honestly, and I thought that was, that was good. And they've survived for 20 years. They, 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 they stayed on campus for a while and then moved off and became a service organization. By 2003, they changed the R from, res they, they were known as International Labor Resource and Information Group. They changed it back to research in 2003, and they're now doing really interesting globalization research with an international perspective. So they've gone through an interesting transition. Um, I myself shifted to higher education studies. I shifted fields. That's how I got involved. I got involved in uh, 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 university, so research into university, and I'm now not an engaged scholar anymore. I'm studying a scholarship of engagement. Thank you very much.